Thanks. It being 4 p.m. January 7th uh, here in City Council Chambers, I'll call the meeting to order and uh, ask the assistant to call the roll. Sure. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Bidwell. Here. And Councilor Nash. Here. Thank you. And seeing no public comment, I'll move on to ask if there is a motion regarding the minutes. Moved and approved. Second. Moved and seconded to approve minutes of December 3rd. Um, any additions, corrections? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that motion carries. And we'll move right on to, first of all, I want to thank uh, Police Chief Jody Casper for coming and um, turn it over to you. You've received some of the questions that the council has had. So. Yes. I received a request just for a general update on public safety issues, uh, some information about NETA, and then also the department's experience with some of our seasonal activities. So that's what I prepared for you. Um, so as far as a general update on public safety, I think the thing that's most notable that you're probably the most interested in is regarding staffing and the continual challenges that we face around staffing. Um, so the unemployment rate is at a 30-year low, which is great, uh, but we're in the midst of a policing shortage across the country. This is not unique to Northampton, not unique to Mass, not unique to, uh, you know, anywhere. It's, it's happening all over the place. And why is it happening? variety of reasons. There's a lot more jobs out there. Um, there's jobs in the private sector that pay more than public sector jobs. Uh, the job is doesn't have a lot of flexibility, so some people may not want to work overnight or work long hours, whatever it may be. Obviously, there's a danger component as well. Um, and there is also a, there's been a lot of changes in the way that police are perceived over the last three years. Um, so there's a lot that plays into it, uh, but we have a lot less people applying for jobs. And some of you have, have sat in on some of our um, hiring days when we're looking at new candidates, and, and, and Councilor Bidwell uh, was in one, and, and the candidates are different than they used to be. Uh, they don't come to us with experience. They don't come to us uh, often with even a degree in the field. Um, they come to us pretty new. <laughs> so. Um, that is very challenging. It's challenging for us to be able to identify candidates in the interview sessions that are going to be a good fit because they don't, they haven't worked in policing yet. And sometimes someone may think they're going to like it and then they put on the uniform and start working and it's different than what they thought it was. Um, so we're worried about you know losing people. We, we invest all this money into training them. We go to the academy uh, and then they come out and may not be a good fit for it. So that is, is a challenge that we see on the hiring end uh, and again, not, not unique here, but certainly we are experiencing that without a doubt. Uh, the other thing that's kind of unique is, you know, we do this in policing. You have to get hired first, and then we send you away to go to training, uh, which is different than many other careers. So we hire you, uh, then we wait for an academy to come along, um, then you're gone for the five to six month academy, then you come out and you're trained for four months in field training, then you start working. So as an example, uh, we had a couple officers leave our department in October and November of 2018. Um, the next academy here isn't until June. So all the way from, so that vacancy began, say, November 1st, 2018. Academy goes all, the academy starts in June. It won't finish till December, four months of training. They won't be on the street. That vacancy won't be filled until April <coughs> or May of 2020. So that is one of the challenges we have is we're, we're also waiting for the academies to start before we can hire people. So those are our challenges. That's um, a big challenge. <laughs> it is actually. It's, it's is that a big like challenge. 18 months? Is that pretty much what you? Yeah, it depends on when the next academy is. If someone resigns yeah, two months before the, the academy scenario, starts. Yeah. Right. And that was the worst case scenario. The last academy started in October. So yeah. someone resigned that month and then the month back, two resignations, October and November. So that's like worst case scenario because an academy just started. Now we have to wait for that whole academy. Yeah. Um, so that is unfortunate. Um, the other thing that's kind of unique is a lot of times if you, our department is staffed for 65, that's how many positions we have full time on our department. 50 of those are what you see on the street more. They're your uniformed officers. So this isn't supervisors or anyone else. These are your police officers. Um, 
five of them are assigned to the detective bureau, so they're plain clothes, so minus five. Um, one is in the schools, that's Officer Wallace, and one is currently serving in an IT function, although we're making a change there. So that's seven, so out of the 50, we actually have 43 that are police officers in uniform who are supposed to be working the street. I made a graph, who doesn't love a bar graph? Um, I made a couple copies so you can pass it around, but it's, it's interesting, uh, essentially, we can yeah. share with I have my own copy in here. Sorry to mess up. I'll pass one to them and um, yeah, yeah. then I can most. So I made you that so that you can understand uh, oh, what. Oh, it's not actually. Yeah. It took oh, one more. Yeah, yeah. I think it four. four. I think it was four. Thank you. So if you look at it, just so I can explain what you're looking at. Uh, you know, when someone's green, they're new, right? That's the academy. So on the bottom there, um, when you look at all the greens, you may see greens that have a three or a four. That means we have three people in the academy or four people in the academy. The yellow is when they're in the field training program. Red is they're injured, they're medical out injured, and black is a vacancy. So even though we may have 50 positions to work the street, you can see in September was our worst month. We actually had 12 of those positions, um, either three of them were vacant, or you can see the other nine were not working. So that's another challenge we face, is that even though we have staffing, or we have the, the vacancies or the positions for- Where's the FTEP? I think that's that, the yeah. training part. That's the four oh, okay. of training yeah. Yeah. after the academy. So this <clears> is the challenge that we face, and, and September was very bad. Having tw you know 50 minus 12, you're looking at 38 people. Um, it's very challenging to cover yeah. the city. Um, this year, this, this last 2018 calendar year, we had 800 hours of forced holdovers. Some people sign over time on their own. Uh, in our department, we had to force someone over however many times that was. It was 800 hours of forced time. That has an impact on burnout and morale and also safety. If someone comes into work expecting to work 3 to 11 and then go home and go to bed, they unexpectedly have to work 11 to 7 in the morning. That is not great. We, we would prefer to avoid that. but. Um, it's tricky. So this is one of the challenges we're facing. We're looking at this, trying to figure out, you know, what we can do to uh, to, to better manage our, our staff. But it's been the way it's been for a long time. Um, Chief. Yep. The month of December. Yep. And then looking at November, the red. Mm-hmm. And then October. Yep. September significant. September significant. Yeah, that was we lost a lot. Yep. And it was when you say medical. Yep. Is that on duty that it occurred, like hurt themselves, or whatever? It's mixed. Some have been hurt on duty, and they're out after surgeries or whatever else, and some are off-duty injuries with surgeries. Uh, we had a lot of injuries on and off-duty this year, which is a lot of red. So those are people at home um, who are filling one of the police positions. So you, you can see the challenge, but this is why we're... That's wild. Is the number so, correspond to the number of positions? Yes, so okay. the number in it, right, so like in September, you can see in the black, the three, that means we have three, va we have three vacancies. I understand. Yeah, okay. So then you can see in October, there's no more black, because I told you the academy started in October, right? Yeah. So we were able to fill those positions. Yeah. Uh, but then you can see also that then someone resigned, so then we lost someone in yeah. November. Yeah, okay. And you can also see in December, the green number drops to four, and that's because someone got knocked out of the academy. So, right, so... Right. Oh, then I see. Someone, if they're injured in the academy or they don't meet uh, standards, right, and in this case it was So well, we had five. No, we, we had five. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then we dropped one. Yep. So and They're kind of in the limbo waiting position. Right? <coughs> in the academy or are they, the, are they employed while they're in the academy? They're employed okay, as so. a student officer. Yep. Yeah. They're not in the union yet, but they're being making that um, right. student officer rate. So the mm -hmm. problem is that takes up the space. So if someone fails out of the academy, same thing I just said to you, like, you know, if it's if someone resigns that month, it's very hard. We won't be able to fill that until the June Academy. So and you know, people are coming to us, I mean, just people are coming to us not as physically fit as they used to be. I think mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago, all those of us applying for jobs, even if we weren't fit when we knew we wanted to be a cop, as soon as we realized we did, we were out there running and doing push ups and all that. And yeah. we're seeing different um, abilities of people who are coming in and applying and and that's just not my judgment looking at people but when mm -hmm. they take the pre-exam to get 
in the academy, they're not doing well. Are the requirements less stringent? So, yeah, so it's interesting. Mm -hmm. They had, so what happens, it used to be they just changed it. It used to be so that you could go into the academy and like your fitness level was whatever it was. There, there wasn't a um, running type of test to get in. But then when people were going in, you have to run every day and lift things and all that, and people weren't able to meet those standards. So they were losing them on physical fitness in the academy. So, the, so every chief is having the same experience. We're like, hmm, people don't seem to be as fit as they used to be. So now the, the MPTC, the, the government body that organizes the, the and sets the standards for training, they now have a requirement when you, before the academy, you have to run and do push-ups and all that. <coughs> but we're nervous, you know, that <laughs> people, we want to make sure people are going to be prepared for that now. So we'll see how that goes. But Because yeah. we certainly don't want to lose people in the academy for physical fitness. Right. I mean, there's a lot of ways to lose people. We certainly don't want it to be for that. I so. recall when, and I think Council Connie you recall this also, Chief Sinkowitz, every time during our budget hearings, mm -hmm. we heard the same thing about losing police officers and they were getting better jobs. And he would come out and use an example, state police, mm -hmm. better benefits, higher pay, mm -hmm. or other areas of more money. So we're hearing the same thing again. Yeah, we just had an officer resign last week for MS State Police. Yeah, and he said, I'm, I'm happy, I like it, but it, it, it's that's hard to compete. Hard to compete with that wage yeah. level and everything else. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. points about physical fitness are still high. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's a struggle. So we're hoping that people will be better prepared when they're when they know they have to pass this test in the academy. We'll see. Chief, <laughs> um, yeah. when we when we when you lose someone not because they go to a higher paying position, mm -hmm. state police or elsewhere. What are, what are the what are the other reasons um, that, that you learned from exit interviews? Right. So I didn't make this for you, but this is my <laughs> my this is what we do: employee separation. This tracks why we've lost employees since 2003. Um, and essentially, you know, looking at we're always trying to find patterns because obviously we don't want to lose people. So what is it that we're doing? And even though I won't pass it around, anything all the blue you see on there, that light blue, those are all people leaving for other police agencies. For other so, what? Other police agencies. So for me, that's my biggest concern. Ideally, we want everything to be purple, which is retirement, right? But it's just, that's not what we see. So we lose a few. Is that broken down to state police versus local? It is, actually. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. because I love our graphs. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we, in 2017, we lost three to the state police. We only lost three employees in 2017, and all three went to the state police. Right. Um, in 2018, we've lost five, six, seven, eight. We lost eight just in 2018. Four of them were to other departments. The departments were Greenfield, Belchertown, Wilbraham, and Agawam. Did they make more money? Yep. Yep. So then the, uh, the remaining to the state police? Uh, well, the state police, he just resigned last week, so that was 2019 technically. Oh, I so, see. Yeah. They made good money. The state police? Yes. Yep. My yep. girlfriend's husband is in yeah. It's a totally different job. It is. The thing yes. about state police is, you know, it's actually a lot of people, they just, they want to be troopers. There's other, there's a lot of things you can do as a trooper that you won't be able to do as a municipal cop in many cases. Um, and, you know, they, they just, they grew up wanting to be a trooper. I mean, it's just, right. it's a little bit of a different thing. But it is frustrating to lose people to other municipalities. That's what I, yes. is my struggle. You know, we invest a lot of money as a city, a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard to see people. We get the. Does it have to do with the residency? Do you think, or it's mixed. What so, about, like for example, losing North Hampton residents to go work in another police department. I don't think that's ever. I, not no, and recently yeah. that hasn't okay. happened. Most a lot of our officers don't live here. Um, right. They live in yeah. Belchertown, right. Westfield, and Chicopee. So they go home and as much as they can. Right? Yeah, we have one that went home. He lived in Belchertown, and he. One, he became an right. officer of Belcher Town. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Belcher Town, their top step is 62,000. And our top step is 55. How much? 62,000. That's, that's actually at the top of that's whatever. That's the top step. And our top step is 55,559. Yeah. Five, that's yeah. after being here for however many years it would take to attain that level of. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's our step eight. But the, step starting, eight. the starting step is still. 
probably low 40s. Or? It's the starting step in Belchertown is 41107. And what are we 30? No, we're 44 <laughs> oh, um, 288. Yeah. Uh, but once you're on here for like the one we lost had been with us for four and a half years, so he's coming in there at a higher rate than he was making here. So. Yeah, it's, I look at this too, because obviously we don't want to prevent this from occurring. It's right. not, right. you know. But if uh, someone has the option of a hot, slightly higher pay rate and right, only right. a few miles from home. Are they able to take their time and transfer it? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. And because there's a policing shortage, of course, other departments are thirsty for de for officers that already have the academy. I mean, like, you know, especially awesome ones like right. ours. And the reality is Northampton cops are awesome. Uh, people yeah. take them because right. they're highly trained. And they don't have to pay to train them. They don't have to pay to train right. them. And yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have great staff, so yeah. they like our staff. So, yeah, so actually every other surrounding community pays more than us. Um, Belchertown, Wilbraham, they are at 59, 60. Five. Amherst is at 61.054. These are their top steps. So yeah. um, Greenfield's at 60.991. But UMass, hiring people who are Northampton residents or committed to Northampton is probably said. I don't know how yeah. much that can be factored into the application process. No, we absolutely weigh that in heavily. So when yeah. we're looking at people, we, we and you, you know you, you've been in there. Um, we absolutely weigh that in, and it's there's not a lot of Northampton residents that apply. Yeah. There's like almost none. I think we had maybe two out of the last group of interviews. Well, we now have a criminal justice program at Smith Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're linked into them in the sense that one of our lieutenants, Bob Powers, is a liaison with them. So, yeah. we, you know, that is going on. But interestingly, I spoke with one of the instructors up there, and she she's saying you know, a lot of them don't want to actually be police officers. They want to be parole, probation, military. So even though it's a criminal justice program, yeah. it's not it's not all police officers that, that are in there. Mm -hmm. So I know. We're very That's interested true. in that program. Yeah. Because we'd like them to right. <laughs> yeah. want to work here. And I, I be a good feeder. I really think it would be great that, you know, if we're hiring a lot of our Hampton residents, of course, but we just don't have more time. What does the mayor say about the difference of these towns that you're talking about, of them paying more than what we're getting here. I don't know. I guess you'd have to ask the mayor. I, I mean, will. you know, it's. I think it's uh, still in the ballpark. Yeah, it's, we're it's, not, it's we're in the ballpark. Not much. <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're not like extremely lower than. Yeah, but right. right there, but. Right, it's a challenge. Yeah, the tough thing is if you're if you're 25 and you're looking at a 30-year career ahead of you, the difference in $9,000 a year over yeah. 30 years, and when you're talking about retirement, is is a lot. Right, yeah. $9,000 is significant. So, if, yeah. what what has been done in in recent years to address the well, the, we've, the need to make, make adjustments? Right. So we've changed our hiring practices in that we've gotten rid of the written test. Uh, we used to have the written test, which I think was limiting for, for some people. If, for instance, our test was only given every two years. So Are you talking about civil service? No, we got rid of that in oh, 2005. Yeah. Okay. So we got rid of civil that's service, right. and that right. was great. That was, yes. thank God, that's gone. For me, anyway, it's much easier to hire. But uh, former Chief Sinkwitz had put into place a written exam, and that, that was great. Most departments were doing that. but. What happens is if I give a test today, the scores are good for two years, and in a week, someone fantastic walks in the door. They're a resident, they want to work here. I can't because <coughs> they didn't take our test. Mm -hmm. So it was limiting. And, and then also, you know, we were, we were, you know, had scores working kind of top to bottom. And that, that doesn't always play out best when you're looking for different sorts of candidates. Like if you wanted to hire someone from Northampton because you think they're more likely to stay, but that person scored less than someone else, you know, is that really, you really want to hire the higher score because they have a higher score. We just wanted to be able to judge people for their, uh, you know, the factors that we value. And since we have an associate's degree as a minimum hiring standard, which most departments do not have that, we felt like having that degree um, was enough to show that, like, they were knowledgeable and, you know, if the written test was going to try to wash out people that maybe wouldn't have the skill level to be able to do it. We felt like we have the associate's degree. If you went to college, you got a degree, you have a reasonable GPA, um, you must be all right. So that's kind of where we start, and then we look at the other things that we're looking for. And we're looking for really different officers in our community. As you all know, we, we need people who have really different backgrounds and more, <coughs> more um, you know, the guardian mindset. You said you're not really getting the critical mass of applicants absolutely to be able not. to. No, absolutely not, no. 
Um, so that is a challenge. But again, true nationally, you know, this is something that is going on here and also going on uh, all over the place just because people don't want to go into the field as much. So, yeah. So that's my update on, on that kind of, I think it's interesting. And again, bar graphs. Yeah. <laughs> so um, opioids, you had asked a, a bit about uh, that. And so I can give you the, the data that I have. Um, you know, we have the DART program. Northampton is where the DART program began. It's grown from just three officers to now seven. Those officers don't just go out and do follow-up on their own. Uh, they partner with recovery coaches. And recovery coaches are people who have usually faced addiction themselves and are now in recovery, and they pair up with the officer and go out and, and talk to people and try to provide services. So that's been a really good partnership, working, of course, uh, with Hampshire Hope. Um, and Last year in Northampton, I got this information from Hampshire Hope this morning. Um, in 2017, Northampton had four uh, suspected overdoses related to opioids. Unfortunately, in 2018, up until the end of November, we had 10. So that number has uh, gone up quite a bit. We're the highest in Franklin and Hampshire counties. The nearest to us are Belchertown and East Hampton with six uh, suspected opioid deaths apiece in that same time period. So definitely still struggling. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think we've done a lot of incredible work. I think the stigma around addiction, if we could measure that, uh, we, I think we'd see dramatic changes in that area in the way that police think about addiction, in the way that members of our community think about addiction. We're really um, having some really positive impact on that and, and that's probably one of the first steps of working on this really complex issue so um, well while, while the number of overdose deaths is uh, you know still difficult and you know, obviously we should have been a lot lower uh, we're still doing a lot of great work in that area and getting more Narcan out there in the hands of bystanders so um, and that's Hampshire Hope is doing that well, it's not our department but um, that's getting out there. Our officers are all carrying multiple doses. They carry a dose for themselves in case they're exposed. Um, so uh, doing a lot of work there. And it's just, it's very difficult. So. And we had um, Meredith O'Leary here mm -hmm. at our last meeting. And I asked her, what was the difference between heroin and opiate that's going on? Mm -hmm. And never knew, she said, that heroin was so expensive mm. versus the opiate. Mm. It's the other way around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and heroin. I think if she has, gets the heroin is much cheaper if you get it cheaper. on the street. Right. Yeah. If you get but, it on the street. Right. But well, that's the only way to get the heroin. Right. 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 But the other, the thing that has changed about heroin is that it used to be heroin, and now it's mostly fentanyl. So when you look at those numbers of deaths. You know, you go to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and you look at their overdose deaths. Uh, I, I believe it's 75 or 80 percent of it is cut with fentanyl. So it's fentanyl that's actually causing a lot of these fatal overdoses. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, you, you, there's been in the news lately information on the fentanyl test strips to try to tell whether or not it's fairly controversial. But like, it's just an uphill battle. You know, you feel like you get a hold of one thing and then something new uh, enters into it. So there's a class. Thursday, yeah. and we're attending that. What's that course? Just Thursday. Narcan training. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, every, everyone should know how yeah. to administer it, and it's just, it can happen anywhere. And, and our overdoses are occurring in, in public places, in public bathrooms, but, you know, sometimes. And so, yeah, it's a, a difficult struggle for all involved. So. Do we do we track how often uh, Narcan is administered? Mm -hmm. We do. So I mean, we so a pro, you know how what's an estimate in the last year of how many times? It's on our open data portal, but a rough estimate would be about thirty to thirty-five. But it's on the open data portal if you want to verify that. You mean but, police administration? Um, you, well, there's a. So it's like third because you also get the first responders. <laughs> I mean, the right, you know, the fire. It, yeah, and, it's and mixed. Sometimes right. too, we arrive on scene. A bystander has administered one dose, and then we administer a dose. Right. So, and we do track that. It's all tracked. Right. I just don't have the data in front of me. 
but well, I mean, just in terms of the NPD being part of that program along with our emergency services that you know that yes the the uh, overdose deaths are up but these you know roughly 40 people that could have also overdosed overdosed as well oh yeah and I suspect be, it is kind of an interesting thing we used to be able to track overdoses better because we got called on most of them but now that bystander Narcan is out there it's <coughs> more likely that people are being revived in their own homes and not calling right. for services so right. it's really hard to get a good right. number on number of overdoses in the community yeah yeah so interesting yeah it is interesting so any, any other questions on that Sorry, it's not better. Maybe I'll come back with lower numbers next year, but it's kind of difficult. Um, I, I, so for hate crimes, just to mention it, I, it's been something that it's discussed in our community. You know, when things occur, usually it's more on everyone's on everyone's minds. But I'm on the governor's uh, hate crimes task force. It's been really good work over the last year or so. Maybe uh, we meet out in Boston every couple of months or so. Um, there were a couple of recommendations. It, the, the task force is divided into kind of education and law enforcement. So I sit on the law enforcement subcommittee and um, some of the recommendations out of there I think have been really good. Uh, and so the governor sent out a letter maybe two months ago or so um, asking or recommending for police chiefs to do a certain, certain things. One is to adopt the IACP's model policy. Uh, which ours was pretty close on that anyway, but we and we had done it before the recommendation came out from the governor. But we do have that model policy, which is great. It means that the policy that we have on investigating hate crimes and bias based incidents is the model recommended by the national organization. IACP is the International Association of Chiefs of Police, it's kind of our principal and guiding uh, organization. So, a lot of model policies come from the IACP. So, we adopted that policy and distributed it to our staff. So, we have that in place. And they also recommended that we have a civil rights officer, so one of our officers serving in this very particular role. And the role of that officer uh, will be to kind of be the, the expert in the field, uh, also liaise, uh, serve as a liaison with certain uh, community members. And also, um, the state is working to create a, a database where we can enter in hate crimes so that they can be better tracked in communities. And it will be the job of the civil rights officer to do that. Uh, of course, we're already part of the open data um, that, we, that we already have, the White House uh, Police Data Initiative. So we already have our hate crimes posted on there. So we're uh, kind of ahead of the curve there. But the state, there's not a centralized database for it across the state. Um, so they really want to fill in those missing numbers to try to get a better idea of what we're dealing with in our community. So, so they would have to go through training on civil rights, though. Yes. So That's the, intense. <laughs> Yeah, the MPTC is tasked with putting together a, a training for civil rights officers. So ideally, every community, all 351, <coughs> would have a civil rights officer. And then they'll go to those trainings. So That's great. And they'll be able to get a better picture as a commonwealth, really, how many, you know, because we all wonder that, right? right? We can talk about it, but should you really see it recorded? We don't really know. Well, we do have data locally. What, what any, any particular trends? That you're seeing? Most of ours, and again, if you go on our website, you can see them. We range between you know one and maybe four or five uh, in a year. Most of them are vandalism. So on our open data portal, you can actually see exactly what happened. So if what happened was swastikas were spray painted on the wall, that's what it says happened. So you can get a really clear picture. And I, I want to say we had one year where we had five, and that was the highest that you know we had um, documented. And I, I think. Two or three of them were, were vandalisms. But again, I'd refer you to the open data portal just to be sure on that, those mm -hmm. numbers. Um, and, and certainly we've had some incidents where there's been, you know, people actually you know, you know, assaulted each other or something. But not very many. I think our community is attentive to early indicators, you know, whether it be in our school systems or in other communities where they see concerning things, they report those things. So. Any questions about hate crime? Um, NETA, you, your committee had asked specifically about NETA. Um, I've had a lot of contact with NETA through all these months beforehand after uh, implementation of adult use marijuana sales. The biggest issue, as I'm sure you all know, is parking. <laughs> um, parking is the biggest, we get the most complaints from Wright Avenue because it's yes. a public street. 
Uh, there's still a lot of problems in the private lots there, and they're dealing with those by private tows. Um, Prolube, the doctor's office, you know, that's 90 Con Street, a few of the other buildings down there have definitely had to privately tow vehicles. We're, we're not involved in private tows, so I can't, I, I don't have those numbers for you. Um, but Wright Avenue was a struggle. I plan to meet with um, the director of the DPW down there and do a, it, it, the street was changed after it was paved. It was paved and it became narrower. So I believe it lost about seven or eight feet um, due to a, a tree belt that was put in, um, which then makes it so it's kind of challenging to have cars on both sides of the road down there. So we're trying to look at that to see what the best option is for the community there on Wright Avenue. Um, so that's, and, and we've had parking on, on Pleasant Street on the right side there uh, as you're traveling northbound. There's been some blocking of a PBTA bus station there, a bus stop, um, but the overall cars are okay there. The biggest issue with cars parking there is it's unexpected or there's no crosswalk. Mm -hmm. So drivers don't expect to see someone darting from a car. You can envision that part of Pleasant Street that's kind of odd and it's dark early now and they're open until 10. So transitioning over to um, pedestrian parking, uh, pedestrian issues in that area, that's another major issue. So parking and then pedestrians are unexpected. Uh, on Con Street, there's a crosswalk that goes from like the bowling alley side over to Pleasant Street Auto, there's a crosswalk there. It's dark uh, and people don't expect to see people crossing there because there's not usually, there hasn't historically been a lot of pedestrians And there's walking. a lot of parking over on the Gazette example, yeah. right? And yes. Are there other places besides the, I know I, I just saw a whole strip yep. at so the Gazette when the I was Gazette there. The Gazette and the Department of Public Health have both, um, NETA has worked out spaces with both of those mm -hmm. organizations. Oh, okay. So they have an allotted, at different times of day and days of week, yeah. they have a allotted number of spaces that they're paying for, I believe. Uh, but of course, people are parking in the bowling alley or in the hotel, you know, trying right. to scuttle across right. the street there. So. Yeah, but just that that area is not used to <laughs> that many pedestrians down there. Um, so right, I, the pedestrian. It's not a lot of walkers. A lot of walkers. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, and people do not expect walkers there. Right. So, um, I do know, the, Chief. Yep. At our Rotary Committee meeting that we had today, the mm -hmm. mayor came in mm -hmm. to speak, and one of the residents who lives on Wright Street is mm -hmm. a member of our Rotary. And she said it was awful. She said that her car has gotten hit. Mm -hmm. Another car on the street has got has gotten hit. Mm -hmm. And she said it's terrible there. That's true. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing reported as well. And the problem is there's there's a lot of driveways there. So right. there's like five driveways on one side and I believe four on the other. So if you have cars parked on both sides of the street and it's narrower and you're going to back out, you're backing out and then there's cars that behind you yep. and cars are pushing the limits with parking too close to the driveway and I know um, it's not one way either, no it's no, not right. no and Nancy Forstall has been receiving these calls and her park enforcement officers have been in the area and they've been working on you know ticketing if they're too close to driveways you know it's kind of unique because a lot of these people they're not from here so they come here they get a ticket and they leave so there's not like the lesson learned effect right uh, and i mean they may come back at some point Have but it's a just sense of what percentage of the uh, 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 folks are from out of the area i would assume it's like a vast majority i think so but i can't give you a number i've walked down there i'm sure you all have right at different times right. you've driven by and it's like a lot of out-of-state right. places huge. right I would right. love to have that number. I've been tempted to go stand in line and just be like, where are you from? <laughs> well, well, they, 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 they certainly have that data. I don't know. Do they, do oh, they, yeah, they, would have them. they collect everybody's license plate right. or they, a driver's yeah, license. Yeah, so they, they, so they, they yeah. would have the data. I'd be fascinated. I would guess it would be the majority. I would guess somewhere around 60 or 70 percent. Just based on the license plates that I see in the areas. Right. It's a lot of New Jersey, New York. Yeah. Right. Because really in terms of the East Coast and mm -hmm. Massachusetts, I don't know if you, there's nothing else. Right. There is not. Can't, there's nothing down to I New York, we were, we were, and so, we you know, I mean, if you agree to go from New York, you get it. Right. I think what Councilor Bidwell is saying makes sense. I think you would be able to get that survey of how many a day mm -hmm. and where they're from. Yeah. I don't know if they'd be willing to share it. They may, that might maybe kind of like, yeah. yeah. 
But the issue is for when it comes to parking tickets, I mean, the way parking tickets work is you get one, and then when you go back the next day, you don't do the same thing. But right, in right. this case, no, that's you know, people don't come as frequently, right. so. Every day is the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little more challenging. It's a I wonder if it's change up to the business, like at the local, what's the, what's the Fairfield Inn? Is there the one next to I would just uh, wonder how many people are making a trip to come mm -hmm. and stay. And I have heard uh, anecdotally that they've seen a, a big increase, and definitely at the beginning of uh, yeah. like November 20th or whatever it was, right. uh, <coughs> they had through a year. So, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. I so. thought for sure with the stamp team opening up, it would slow it down over here, but it's not. No, they got the mm -hmm. mark. They got a mm -hmm. marketing mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. yeah. So over over time, you know, we expect that. <laughs> dissipate as, mm. as other, uh, mm. other places open both in Northampton and elsewhere but I, what I'm curious about is we could have as many as another three or four or five mm -hmm. um, opening in Northampton on on Main Street on yep. Pleasant Street on Pearl Street up in like the, the Talbots yep. and given what we've seen here what, what you know, sort of looking forward, what's the planning for parking issues mm. uh, as others will inevitably open up? Well, I, I think that as more open dissipation, that's what we're hoping for. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There's no plan. I mean, those other places that you, Talbots, they have a good parking lot in that parking area. The um, garage is always good spots. Yeah, that's <laughs> good luck. Yeah, <laughs> I can't fewer. People park in that garage, but. I can see his concerns because yeah. I'm here at myself mm -hmm. from an owner right now, rental, with her business, and talking with individuals from Washington who apparently are looking at opening on Main Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are going to, there's one on Pleasant Street that they're looking there as well, and I think those are really going to be foot traffic oriented places. Yeah, but it could be we'll hard to see how it washes out. Yeah. yeah. Right, but more integrated into the Northampton experience, probably. Right. 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 And then who knows? Coming the and parking and having dinner and doing your shopping. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and then maybe some of the people downtown who are currently walking or driving down to Netta, I mean, you know, then they'll use the one that's closer. Right. Uh, we'll have to kind of wait and see. You're going to need police for us. <laughs> so, but, uh, but it's been relatively peaceful otherwise. In oh, terms oh, yeah. Of yeah, we've had we've had zero you know significant incidents down there. There's been some car accidents around the area, um, minor, but people making poor choices, yeah. <laughs> snaking around to get you know random U-turns, unexpected U-turns, hitting cars, and whatever else, driving up on a rock yesterday. Or, that happens, um, but nothing nothing major. No criminal incidents. We haven't had any OUI drug marijuana arrests, which I know has been a question that um, people have been curious about. We do expect to see that um, tick up over time, but we'll see. That's what other states experienced. Was it, it wasn't like the day they opened, then all of a sudden we started arresting people. It's the gradual change in culture and how people think about marijuana, and then you, you know we see that impacting our impaired operators. So we'll have to wait and see. We we have a lot of impaired operators in our community. I think uh, we just wrapped up. 2018, I think we're around roughly 85, so that's a lot. And it is. Yeah, it's a lot. So, but our midnight shift is good. They're on top of it. They're very busy, um, you know, tracking people down and preventing accidents. So that's good. So you're saying 85 OUIs, mm -hmm. all of them alcohol? No, a few fewer drugs, oh. but none, none were marijuana after Netta opened. <laughs> so, I see. I see. You know, but right. we've had there's been heroin <clears throat> and you know okay. some other miscellaneous things. We do track that. We've actually been tracking OUI drugs and what drug they were on since <coughs> medical marijuana came because we were right. we wanted to establish a baseline mm -hmm. and we were curious what will happen. You know what will happen when we get medical marijuana and then what will happen when we get adult use. So we do have that um, baseline data. The thing that we just started tracking, which I think is also interesting, is even if it's an OUI alcohol arrest, was there marijuana involvement? So I, I, I'm imagine you all understand that it's very hard to make an OUI marijuana arrest because That's there's not implied right. consent laws, there's not a minimum standard of how much, and it's different. So if someone is impaired and they have an odor of alcohol and they're, it's, and they're over the, the alcohol, we're always going to charge the alcohol because it's really hard to prove the OUI drug charge. 
Uh, so we're now keeping track of how many OUI alcohol cases we have where, you know, marijuana was in the car or there was admitted use of it or whatever it may be, and just so we kind of see if we see an uptick in, in that, uh, you know, combination used substances before driving. Would you say, Chief, that um, alcohol still is like number one as far as arrest? For, out of OUIs? Oh, oh yeah, it's like 80 to maybe five. I was gonna Roughly. say, because I yeah, did, there's a lot of challenges. Right, I did a paper at Hoyle Community College uh, on alcoholism for today, mm -hmm. and it's amazing mm -hmm. that it is such a bad disease. And mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. And we see a lot of multiple offenders, so OUI, second offense, third offense, fourth offense. Yeah. yeah. Those. And do they get their license back or what? You know, it's funny. People say, like, I don't understand why he had a license if he was OUI 4th. <laughs> Just because it was OUI 4th doesn't mean he had a license. Like, you know, he could have been right. driving unlicensed right, right. and then still had an OUI 4th <laughs> charge. So, but people often make that connection of why did he have a license? <laughs> he didn't, but he was still driving. So, um, you know, for it's incremental. You lose your license for incremental periods of time based on which. And it's OUI. not that easy to get back either. Yeah, it, it, it depends on. Yeah, you have to do a number of things to get it back. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I. So I just want to thank you, Chief, and the NPD for all of the terrific work that you have all done around the Netta opening and uh, helping control traffic around there, helping point parking in the right direction. And, um, you know, as the, the Ward 3 counselor, because the complaints are, they're going to you guys and to Nancy, but they're also coming to me as yeah. well. And that um, I, I want to thank you for being so responsive. Sure. You know, if Nancy were here, here I'd thank her as well. So um, It's no problem. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'll pass that on. We have uh, three traffic officers assigned down there every day, and right. then we have uh, security on the overnight. So that's how that is operating for us. Yeah. So a few things I wanted to add. So um, I did a little survey on Wright Avenue, and this is before New Year's. There were 19 cars parked on the street, 15 had out-of-state plates. Mm -hmm. So that comes out to around 80%. I think it's 79 point something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think that's what we would find, and, and I bet the if we get the information from Netta, that's, that's mm -hmm. roughly gonna be the, the number. Oh, um, and so. so that explains the enforcement problem because these aren't people who are used to parking anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're coming from Pennsylvania or New York, you may have been in Northampton before, but nobody's been parking in that area ever. So, um, uh, yeah, so it's no wonder that people are kind of parking all over the place. Um, and, um, and I appreciate the, the fact that um, we're, we're allowing parking on Pleasant Street. I've, I've had complaints about that from people saying, you know, it, it's creating traffic. And I'm like, yeah, it's also slowing down traffic. This is, this is what traffic calming on Pleasant is going to look like if we allow on-street parking. So I appreciate that emergency, emergency decision. Um, and then, let's see. That bus stop? Yes. It's not an official bus stop. Ah. So it's fine to let people use it for now. I, I would love to see the PVTA actually include that as part of the, the Holyoke bus mm -hmm. as people go into town. So, um, and and the rest we'll save for the TPC. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just realized I'm parking. I forgot to put my placard out. So oh, oh. carry on. Be right back. Okay. Yeah, the only other thing I would add to that is just that we have heard anecdotal reports of people who are purchasing and then using it in their vehicles. Our officers haven't witnessed that, and we haven't gotten any direct reports of it, but we do hear that just sharing. Well, so. I, I've heard that from some neighbors on right. Wright Avenue, and I, I think they're hoping that'll encourage more. <laughs> oh, one more thing I will say is this week, the lines are way down. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, I drove by this morning, I don't know, 9.30 or so, and the line was four people. And I'm used to seeing, you know, know. <clears throat> you know, that the officers can identify by, well, up to the corner, that's a two hour wait. <laughs> wait, if it goes all the way over to the curb cut, that's four hours. So, um, yeah, so it's probably a 15 minute wait for people right now. I think that, you know, the holidays are over, New Year's is over. I, I think we're expecting to see a change. And um, 
So this is a good thing. It also means if there's a little line, that means Net is still making money. There's still oh, yeah, everybody, all those, <laughs> all those customer that. service people are still, <laughs> but we just don't have that enormous line anymore. So. What are the hours? Eight to ten. Eight to ten? Mm -hmm. Including Sundays. Every day, but I think Christmas and Thanksgiving, right? So yeah, they were open on New Year's Day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were? I went over there, I want to see what it looks like on a night where it's not open. And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> Seven <laughs> I, I, days a week? Yeah. I have a quick story about the lines. We had out of, out of town visitors several days before Christmas. And they're coming into town. You have no idea what was going on here. And you see these massive <laughs> lines. And they've been listening to the market being down a thousand points that day. And it's right next to a Florence bank. They were convinced. <laughs> they were convinced it was a bank one. They, they, they could come up with no other possible explanation for why would you think so? Yeah. So they I, found out there was another one. I know a, for a few first night revelers accidentally got in that line too, thinking it was for first night tickets. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I had a ticket of a different okay. sort. Yeah. <clears throat> but mostly it seems inconspicuous to me. I mean, I don't really, in terms of, you know, unless I'm really looking for it, I don't really notice that the, there's a huge amount of people, you know, on both sides. They right. seem to manage it well enough. They the, do a good job. Of, well, it's a perfect location for them. Right. right. It's, it's right, right off, off the highway. Right off. The, it's, it's, people, they, they knew what they were doing when they were. And they paid for the mayor had said today at the Rotary that they paid for all the signs and everything on the streets and that. Yep. Yeah. yeah, they don't they want to be good neighbors. Yeah. You know, they don't want to have people parking and you know and other people. Yeah, they put the signs up where they put up please don't park here for residents. You know, uh, on Wright Avenue. Mm -hmm. So they've been providing signage and stuff. But in terms of this initial period, the revenue must be enormous. I mean yeah. it's you know, they must be raking it in right now, Pretty just well. from the, yeah. Because the overhead is pretty, I mean, you know, seems like a pretty profitable company. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think they're doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> Your uh, last questions were on just our seasonal uh, activities. So the only thing that I think is notable for we, we had the hot chocolate run, the holiday stroll, first night. Those were specifically things that you had asked about. Um, we are making a recommendation for next year to not have the hot chocolate run and the holiday stroll on the same weekend. We Our staff can't handle it. It's too oh. much. Yeah, we end up having to. Because an event like the hot chocolate run, that takes like 20 officers. So yeah. and, and the, the, the holiday stroll takes a bunch too. So we only have so many. And they just um, they much. have to work their regular shifts too and it's, right. it's too much for the city yeah. for our department to handle so i made that request to um amy kaylane and you know we'll, we'll discuss it further in future meetings but that was my recommendation after that weekend um, you know other than that they went very well the holiday stroll like i think we have down much better after not closing off the right. main intersection like right. we did the first time that was really challenging yeah um so it seems it's a great event i i enjoy going to it myself and it's well run well organized um, Joe Barsh is our, he's a sergeant with our department and he does all the events planning. He does a phenomenal job. Um, so he's got it down pat. Anything you want to run in this community, uh, Joe Barsh is all over it. So he organized the hot chocolate run as well. Uh, and that went well, you know, it rained and it was cold. Um, so they didn't have as big of a turnout, but still a massive turnout <laughs> considering the weather. Um, there were still a lot of people out there. Um, so, you know, they have their, their regular impacts with some traffic changes and traffic backup and that sort of thing, but overall, very well run, no major impacts to the city and it, as far as, you know, complaints beyond what you would expect from people not wanting to, you know, take a detour or something. So, uh, first night went well. Again, that was horrible weather. It was rainy. Um, uh, Sergeant Barsh estimated there were about 2,000 people at it. Normally, we, we've had as many as estimated at 8 to 10, so it was really a low crowd due to that weather. Um, but it went fine. Again, that one is pretty much down, down path as far as how we run it. So it uh, went well. So those are all the uh, major events that I don't know what else you would ask about. If, if, if I could circle back with the line to the, the, the staffing issue. Mm -hmm. the, the mayor told us at a council meeting that based on exit interviews in addition to pay issues mm -hmm. uh, morale was 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 cited as a, mm -hmm. as an issue when folks leave can you say a little little more about that 
Yeah, I, I just met with the union leadership from the patrol officers union, so representing about 50 of them, uh, not the supervisors union. And I asked them that question because I knew I was coming here and you thought you may ask me about it. I said, tell me, you know, let's talk more about this, although I feel like I have a sense of it since I've worked there for so many years, but still. Um, so yeah, pay, pay is definitely a factor contributing to people leaving. Um, and workload is definitely a factor. I know that we lost an employee due to his workload was too much. And quite frankly, he went somewhere where he could make more money and do a lot less work. So that is real. Uh, last year we went through a rocky time uh, at, at NPD for a variety of reasons, things in the city that you all are aware of, but also we had a, a very publicly visible um, internal affairs matter, a personnel matter. And you know, that's really hard to work in a place where when you make a mistake, it's all over everywhere and everyone's saying things about it. And it's hard internally it, to have you know, people, you know, it, di it divides people, mm -hmm. their thoughts about it, everyone has different perspectives. Um, so that, that was pretty tough for our department as well, uh, and I, I, we're not recovered from that yet. Uh, you know, we, you probably saw in the news that there was an arbitration award in that, and you know, every time those things come out, it kind of, everything bubbles up around that again. So internal matters are, are really hard because of their public nature. You know, we all make mistakes, and it'd be nice if we could make those mistakes and not have them, um, you know, everyone talking about them and making headlines. It's, um, it's hard to have that kind of job. So that has an impact, and definitely, you know, the, the as I mentioned in, in the email to the mayor, just the um, you know anti-police feeling um, nationally and locally as well. You know, people want to work in a place where they feel like they're wanted. You know, that's big. So it's big, and um, there's as I said in the memo as well. You know, I believe it's a really small section of community members who who kind of drive that narrative in our community. Um, but uh, it has an impact, you know. Our officers in the summertime when they walk down the street, um, they get uh, harassed and sworn at. You know, actually on my way over here, someone told me to F off, so. Um, huh. Yeah, just that language, I don't know what you put in there for that. But, um, <laughs> so that, I mean, I'm just being honest with you because this is, this, this is our community right now. Just walking down mm -hmm. and just came out and said that? Yes, but it's a person who, who you know, uh, who, this community knows, and they don't like us. So, but it's fine. I'm you sure you know. Yes. Oh, I know. I know many of the people in, you know, <laughs> in our community who are, you know, that's right. right. Somebody you know personally who said expletive to you as you were walking over here. Yeah. Well, I only know the person through their involvement with the police department. I mean, oh, I, I've never even oh. had an encounter with the person, but just oh, okay. I, I know that okay. the person. Yeah. You know who they. I know who yeah. they are. That's I don't know. I can't take yeah. But. Um, this is the, the nature of our jobs right now. So I don't want to paint it in any other way. An officer was parked um, yesterday um, running radar and two people approached him and just started yelling at him and calling him names and everything else. So um, while there, there's a lot of support from our broad community and, and, and I, I truly do believe that, but there's a, a higher level of, of aggressive anti-police um, activity going on too. And again, nationally, I, I, this is a problem nationally. Uh, I was just reading an article in the Washington Post, actually, it's a similar situation going on down there, and it, this is something going on. Um, so it's new for us to try to figure out how to best manage. You know, me as a leader of the department, how do I keep officers feeling good about their jobs, feeling, you know, respected, and, and respect seems to have been lost, and that is a word that I think is unfortunately becoming kind of outdated for a wide variety of reasons that we can all envision. but. Um, yeah, it's tough. And so it shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be, and, and it is. And so, and we all experience it. We're all public figures mm -hmm. here, so we all see it from different. You know, we we know what that is. <laughs> we see it, but it's the the way we all communicate with each other. But has what changed. would be the answer? I mean, what can we do as consular <coughs> right, yeah. to help <coughs> the community and the police department right. of having trust? Yeah, because that's a problem. It, it is a problem. It, it's a struggle we we all have. I mean, you have in your roles, I have in my role. We're all trying to figure it out, like how can we best deal with this? Yes. We feel like we're a, and, and I believe that you all believe this, that we're a responsive department, we're a department that listens, and we, we make changes when we need to make changes, and we're pretty open-minded. Um, and, and recognize faults that we have, you know, certainly. Um, 
but we, we still get a lot of that um, kind of aggressive, mm -hmm. disrespectful you know, language and things. So, which that's people's First Amendment rights, and we're respectful of that, but it does make it you know, more challenging to, I mean, you want to love to come into work. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to love to come into work when you do this job. You, you've seen what's gone on in the last week here with some of the things, and your, your municipal employees have gone to deal with that, you know, dealt with the family members, the children, the, the, right. the scene, right? So they're already dealing with that, um, having this additional, mm -hmm. you know. That's hard on families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So, so th th again, I'm, we're all in the same, I, you all get it. I'm just, this is the reality of where we are with morale. It, it's very difficult. I mean, I told you, we're, we held people for 800 hours this year, forced, that's time they had time with their families they were supposed to have, they didn't get to have it, we disrupt vacations, we order people in for seasonal events, you know, we have them go on these difficult calls, um, you know, they get yelled at on the streets by, by a, a few people, but still, you know, if you're walking down the street and say hi and have a nice conversation with 10 people and then one person says something horrible to you, when you go home, that's probably the thing you're going to be thinking about, because you're like, that was awful, you know, and that's the problem, is, it's, is even though there's a lot of, you know, people who take the time to say really nice things and lend their support and, and write an email or stop and say something, um, we tend to focus on that. Other it stops. is kind of a cultural thing, though, that police officers have had to deal with probably more so in the last, I mean, it used to be that it was understood as a, you know, and, and still is, I think, for the most part, by most people to be a highly respected profession, you know, law mm -hmm. enforcement and, you know, public service. You know, to really be, it had to be a calling, kind of, you know, because it's not like the pay's that great, and it's not like, you know. Yeah. So, but, yeah, it's a challenge when you have that kind of, because those are, those are real challenges for police officers. It's not, mm -hmm. you, you, there's a pension at the end, and there's, you know, additional, but it's, it's a tough duty to do a career mm -hmm. in law enforcement like that. So, to not also have the kind of, public support that has always kind of assumed to be there, just, you know, I mean, the respected, um, the respect in the position itself in, in terms of choosing a, you know, a, I a say job. The, the more that I talk to uh, teachers or other people in public service, they're experiencing some issues with people who are lacking showing respect, you know. You know, my partner works in a school, and some of, some of the things that she shares about you know, the, the way people talk to kids, talk to adults, is very different too. So I'm I'm worried about the, the even who's coming up and, and not having a, you know that kind of natural respect that we probably all had for adults and, and people in fields, police officers, teachers, you know, whatever it may have been. So yeah, it's a challenge that our it is. our generation faces. Yeah, it is. Do you think the, the, the actions taken by city council itself filter filter through and have any have any impact on this on this morale issue? Yeah, know, I that's mean, something, that's something I worry about. Right. So the yeah yes, <laughs> I've talked to, I've talked to the union about it and, and asked them. I, you know, how do you feel? And and um, you know, this is a difficult issue for all of us. And 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 you're all council members, and you've all voted in favor of, of budgets and, and tactical things and many things like that. There's been a few issues that have come up that, um, you know, I spoke with your council leadership about and, and in a private setting and a meeting that we had that you all know about and I probably it's best if we just, I don't want to make more of a public matter of this than anywhere else. Um, happy to, you know, talk with you privately if, you know, if you want to talk about that more. Um, it, it has an impact um, overall and, and I do recognize your support in many areas. But there's been somewhere it's been more difficult for our staff to kind of understand, uh, and for me to understand as well, mm -hmm. uh, some of the some of the processes. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> well, part part of me for frankly putting it out there. No, no, I, I you know I, I don't. Shy I think it needs to be much. talked about. So. Yeah, it, it does. I just also think some things are. One of the things that came up in the discussion is really just improving communication, and maybe sometimes. Um, direct communication between people and instead of doing it in public forums mm -hmm. um, is helpful. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that we as a city and as leaders need to figure out 
a way to have this conversation so we're not talking about bullets, Walmart, and you know policing all in the same subject. You know that that we're we're having a broader conversation about the the good work that the NPD does and the work that we want done in our community and. Um, and that I, I don't think that you or the NPD would shy away from having those more difficult discussions. But to have it around these specific, you know, items, you know, whether it's going to be shields or bullets or cameras, it, it invites a, it, it, we go off on tangents and, and we're not able to have a really um, productive discussion. Um, at uh, City Council um, last we met, Lori Loisel, uh, read a list of, of uh, trainings and accreditations that the NPD has. Mm -hmm. Is are those on the website somewhere? Or I, I think that's the kind of things that we want to you know, start talking about. How you know what our police force is doing to be cutting edge, to be um, to be to match the values that you know that our community wants to see and that um, so anyway I'd like to figure out ways we can having something on the the website to point people and say here's what our officers are doing here's here's the trainings that we've done um, I think that would be helpful but so our, our open data portal actually includes a list of different types of trainings and how many hours we've invested in that type of training so for instance the category of like bias based policing which is something that our community cares quite a bit about you could look on there and see how many hours we spent, you know, in 2017 um, studying that. So it, it is on our site. Okay. Um, we update that um, every January, February, March, and once a calendar year is ended, then we have to work on putting those that that data together. And when we release it, I often include a, a post on our social media saying, "Hey, we just released this on um, training. You know, our top training categories were." Or whatever they were. I know last year it was like mental health stuff, uh, bias-based policing stuff. Uh, it's mixed. So we, we do put that out there and we try to highlight uh, the good work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know, maybe we could be, be better at it. But uh, well, I think doing a lot of good work. Maybe us being, you know, that I don't think I've gotten that message or I, I'm on your newsletter. The last time we did it would have been January, February of 2017. So I look forward so, yeah. to that. Well, you should and be then, seeing it soon. <laughs> okay, I, I look forward to seeing it. And, um, and is there going to be a Citizens Police Academy this year? Yes. Yeah. I encourage anybody who hasn't gone I to check it out. And if you good. can't do that, because if it winds up being scheduled on Thursdays again, it needs counsel. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but a, a close second is a valuable experience. It's, it's doing a ride along, which. Um, Tremendously uh, helpful and just understanding in a, in a way you, you can never otherwise grasp. It's yeah. just what a what a night on the ship is, is all about. Mm -hmm. It was amazing when I took it with Marty Blair. Mm -hmm. She took me all around, mm -hmm. and it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the best things we can all do is spend a little time in each other's shoes. You know, mm -hmm. regardless of whatever roles we all play, it's probably one of the things we're missing is some of that shared perspective. So there you go. Any other questions? I'll just say that the, the, the open data portal, open portal is, it really is tremendously valuable information. And um, it's, it's there for everybody to see. And it directly contradicts a lot of what some folks would like to have us believe about police, the, the frequency of various types of police incidents. You look at the data, it's, it's not there. As, as, as you were describing, the last discharge of a weapon by an officer other than for euthanizing an animal or in the firing range, mm -hmm. you believe was something like 1985. Yes. And, and uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's an important data point that, that I doubt most folks realize. Mm -hmm. King Street in front of Dunkin' Donuts, there was some sort of drama out there. I wasn't on that, but I've heard stories. The last, the last chocolate donut. Yeah, <laughs> something happened, some sort of shit out there. <laughs> you mean of a police discharge? Yeah, police. Yeah, there was fire exchange between an officer and a, a subject. I don't know anything yeah. about that. Other than that's the location of it. Right. So, yeah, 85. It's 85. been a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they do a great job. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, split second decisions that they have to make. Yeah. Any other questions? 
anybody else have any comments? Thank no. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, the only other items we have now are those um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, we have six appointments. Um, all of these are for the Charter Review Committee. And we have two that aren't on the agenda, but we know that were referred to us on Thursday. So what I was suggesting... Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's my thought that because the legislation already uh, dictates how this committee will be established, mm -hmm. which is um, appointment by the mayor in consultation with each of the respective wards, um, that that consultation has happened and that these names come to us as having been that it and recommended mm -hmm. uh, by the respective ward councillors. So I would entertain a motion to take them as a group. Um, I would be delighted for to make a motion. Positive recommendation. I'll like second I'll that we, that we that. pass okay. along positive recommendations for all as a group. Thank you. So that was moved and seconded to send the names of Robert Murici, Sam Hopper, Stan, Stanley Moulton, Roberta Sullivan, Patricia Healy, and Molly Fox. And oh, I should have said which wards they were, but those are the clearly evident. But for those particular six appointments, uh, would be go, would go with a positive recommendation to the Falls City Council. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. okay, no abstentions, objections. Okay, and I would assume that, so what we have is a follow-up we'll, for the two remaining, it's two, right? And yes. Two remaining um, on uh, January 17th, is that the next day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll take a recess from the regular council meeting and hopefully take up a similar motion for those remaining, and that way they can have, we can have yep. the whole thing taken up under the consent agenda. Sounds like a good plan. Yes, it does. All right, so that's all we have on our agenda for tonight. We don't actually have a specific um, plan for the February meeting. And I'm wondering if you folks have any thoughts or um, if we know we'll likely have appointments because yeah, yeah. they mm -hmm. come in drips and drabs in the next two months and weeks. So, um, anything that folks had on their radar for, could reach out to for February? Once we haven't seen in a while are probably um, building commissioner. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I'm not sure when we saw fire last, but it seems like it wasn't that long ago. Hmm. Fire DNS. Hmm? Fire? I think you've seen fire since I've been here. Oh, I okay. Would if that's you remember, remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what the fire department? Yeah. Yeah, with Dwayne or, um, you know, with EMS. We could ask fire EMS for right. if it's not too soon to try to do a regular update since it's been a while. Can we make that request? Yeah, sure. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're, you're mentioning building commissioner. As discussions proceed about building commissioner regulation of Airbnbs, I don't know if you mm -hmm. noticed that, that that's, mm -hmm. now, that's now the law. That's yeah. the, the, the state law allows municipalities to, to regulate Airbnbs within the confines of the state legislation. The governor signed it this time. So it'd be interesting to see what uh, what the approach is here, and, and whether bed and breakfasts and Airbnbs are treated in parity, which they, mm -hmm. they should be. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, that somewhere, was brought up today. Somewhere down the road, that mm -hmm. conversation with the mm -hmm. might be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's think about that for maybe a follow-up. Uh, um, so that's something to think about. Mm -hmm. 
meeting in March or something. All right, so with those thoughts, I'll ask if there's a final motion. No Second. Okay, non-debatable. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.